So I'm going to talk about trauma-induced coagulopathy. It's a small component, small but important component of the management of the, of the trauma patient. Um, evidence about patients presenting to the emergency department from trauma already with an established coagulopathy first sort of came to light, particularly by Karim Bohe's group, um, and we know that this coagulopathy is uh, generally in shock patients um, uh, and um, it's mostly modulated by unopposed activation of uh, protein C. Um, it's unique to severely, trauma, um, severely injured trauma patients. Um, about 40% of patients may have it. Um, Concerningly, and why is it important, it's mostly associated with a fourfold increase in mortality. Um, and uh, key features are systemic anticoagulation, dysfibrinogenemia or hypofibrinogenemia, platelet dysfunction, and fibrinolysis. Um, as a consequence of this, uh, we, uh, well, not we, uh, it just led to the evolution of the major hemorrhage protocols. Um, that were developed in, in, to try to fix or treat or prevent trauma-induced coagulopathies. Um, there's no doubt that they've improved survival. Um, uh, however, there is a lot of um, controversy surrounding which protocol to use. If you're going to use a ratio protocol, what is the best ratio? If you're going to use a targeted protocol, uh, how should you monitor it in terms of what should you target, what are your endpoints, and uh, which factor concentrates or products should you use to, to, in an attempt to uh, particularly replace the fibrinogen. Um, most people think of it as a, as a disagreement, it's mostly a discussion between continents as to how best to achieve this. And I think there's a bit of evidence coming in both, um, and the answer is most probably going to be somewhere in between. Um, the proper study looked at one to one to one versus one to one to two with the ratio of platelets and uh, FFP to either one or two bags of, of, of red blood cells. I think um, packed red blood cells, I think most people are aware of the proper study. Um, but some information started coming out again, mainly from Karim Bohe's group, that if you don't replace your, your fibrinogen with a either cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate, if you're just giving FFP, you're not going to get that fibrinogen up um, high enough to, to have a therapeutic effect and reverse the trauma-associated coagulopathy. So if we were to assess the trauma, if we were to, how, if we were to, to write a list about what we might need to assess it, we'd want something that assesses all components of the coagulation pathway, um, the procoagulants, anticoagulants, and fibrinolytic pathway. The test would need to be rapidly available, individualised, inexpensive, inexpensive, and uh, give us some information about what products the patient might have been on, um, and uh, also lead us to to determine when to stop the aggressive resuscitation and move towards uh, thromboprophylaxis. Standard laboratory tests are limited, as we know. They generally stop at the first stage of coagulation when the clot forms, and we know that the clot size and strength, in, as indicated by the degree of cross-polymerization, is, 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 is important. Um, these standard uh, tests are not designed for multifactorial coagulopathies, and they don't give us any information about clot strength or breakdown. Um, so it's not surprising then that we've, we're trying to use tests that, that are d designed to monitor warfarin, that they are then maybe potentially poor predictors of, uh, of, of trauma-induced coagulopathy and or poorly um, have limitations in terms of how we can use them in the resuscitation. Which leads us to the discussion about viscoelastic hemostatic assays. Um, it's not a new um, technology. Um, it was mostly, um, although it has changed in years. Class, I was going to make a comment about your age, and then I thought I, I, I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> Uh, but it's been around for a long time, and importantly, the technology is improving so that the interfaces are becoming much more user-friendly and limited in terms of potential errors for those of you who might have missed uh, classes talk in the previous session. 
we use Rotem in our, in, our, in, our, in our system, and I'll talk to you a little bit about how we are attempting to mitigate or manage our trauma-associated uh, coagulopathy. That's just the viscoelastic tracing um, that, uh, that uh, um, you get from either TEG or Rotem. You get some information about the initiation of the clot and uh, the factors that may be deficient in, in the patient if there's a prolonged clotting time or R time. The amplification uh, relates to um, uh, clot strength. Uh, clot formation time and uh, sorry propagation relates to the strength and then you can get an, an, a, a feeling about uh, the lysis time or um, as, as uh, sometimes with rare cases of hyperfibrinolysis of, of trauma. So we look at the XTEM, uh, it's active, it's called the XTEM because it sort of relates to the external uh, extrinsic uh, part of the clotting ca of the old clotting cascade, it's activated by tissue factor, which is important, which means you get a, a, a strong thrombin uh, response in the tube. And generally, you're looking um, you're looking at uh, the, the the A5 uh, millimeters to give you an idea as to a clot strength and the clotting time, which is the green which is the green bit there to see potentially if you've got some pre-existing uh, no exodotics involved or factor deficiency or which would have uh, could either be consumptive or pre-existing. The difference between the um, XTEM and the FibTEM, which we use specifically to look at the fibrinogen level, is that uh, the FibTEM has a um, platelet inhibitor um, in its makeup, um, so um, that uh, allows us to get a really accurate impression as to the, with the A5 as to the the, the state of the or the amount of fibrin present and the ability of the patient to form a stable clot. Um, I'll go quickly through these. Um, some of the point of care. Um, sort of prothrombin tet time uh, 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 um, equipment um, uh, potentially has some use, but I think the feeling is that it's just taking too long to, to get an accurate result, and the limitations still exist that they don't give us any information about clot stability. Um, we'll go. We'll go through that. Um, so what does the evidence show for using uh, viscoelastic uh, hemostatic ass assays? I think um, at best they uh, sort of gentle recommendations. Um, the evidence uh, remains uh, low but is coming. Um, I think uh, there is some evidence out there and certainly we use that in the in the drawing up of our protocols that you can use uh, the uh, XTEM and FibTEM in determining certainly your fibrinogen levels. Um, with with a little with some studies, they're going to there there are some uh, paper. This paper was written to give us uh, a hard endpoint about uh, about uh, which, what to target if we're using which test. So what we're we going to target with our with our uh, Fibrinogen, what should we target with our platelets? What should we target um, uh, in terms of whether there's lysis, clot lysis, uh, or not? Um, there's some, there's, there, is, there is some data uh, that's going to come out, um, uh, which, will, which hopefully will give us more information to model and to, 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 to help uh, decide about ratios, about which products to use and about what levels to target. Um, some of this has been incorporated into, into the European guidelines. I won't spend too much time on that because I want to go through some cases which is most probably more important. Um, just a, just a, it is important to highlight the RITIC trial. Um, uh, this is a trial that was stopped um, because there was a concern that there was some harm being done to patients who were only getting FFP because their fibrinogen levels weren't going, weren't going up. So I do think that's an area 
of uh, research and science that we need to pay some attention to. Okay. And so this is just a paper that highlighted uh, some of the targets that we can use. It looks at Rotem, TEG, and the SLT as your standard laboratory tests. And I think we're getting some evidence about what to target in terms of our formulogen platelets and plasma if we need, if we need to replace uh, plasma um, and then uh, what to look at in terms of fibrinolysis if we need to give uh, tranexamic acid. Um, in attempt to, to do some research and to, uh, and to highlight uh, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the various algorithms, James from our unit and uh, some of the other, and Michael Reed from the Royal Brisbane and Military, um, tried to come up with some of the literature uh, with, a, with an algorithm. And uh, if this algorithm is the algorithm that we use in the Gold Coast University Hospital. At our center, all trauma, major trauma response will be attended to by the ICU registrar um, and, and potentially by the duty consultant if, if they're around. Um, the trauma surgeons get activated, the ED team obviously is activated, um, and the anaesthetists will go down, and if there's potentially a head injury, our neurosurgical team will be advised as well. Um, there's obviously a close collaboration with uh, the blood bank, um, and all patients will get a Rotem on admission to the emergency department, and the role of the ICU trainee or registrar at that point is actually to help uh, guide and resuscitate the patient's uh, potential factor concentrate or platelet or whatever needs. Um, and this is done in, in context with the trauma nurse. What this does allow is it allows anaesthetists to focus on theatres if they're going for a red blanket. It allows the ED, ED team to go through their trauma surveys. It allows the surgeons to, to look at images and discuss amongst themselves and with anaesthetists and all interventionists as to what to do. So we, we'll run that as part of the team. So this is our protocol, uh, there, there are four steps to it. The first step is to look at hyperfemolysis. Um, we were in the PATCH trial, uh, which looked at a pre-hospital uh, initiation of tranexamic acid. Um, and as a consequence of that, we haven't seen a lot of uh, hyperfemolysis. Um, but if you haven't got any clot forming, it's difficult to then get a, an appreciation of clot strength or stability. So that's why it's up there. The second step, we have a look at our, um, we have a look at our fibrinogen. Um, we look at the um, A5 on the, on the FibTem. Um, and you can see we've got two different widths there. Generally, we feel from our FASTI data that if we are going to give cryoprecipitate, uh, we should intervene earlier because it just takes us longer to give it to them. So if the A A5 is slightly less than 10, we've most probably got a little bit of time and we can thaw and get the cryoprecipitate. If, however, the A5 is already at eight, and particularly if the patient is unstable, then we would, th well, then we would uh, uh, initiate uh, fibrogen and concentrate. Um, after each step and intervention, if we are giving a factor or we're placing something, we generally repeat the ROTEM uh, 10 minutes after the administration uh, and uh, either replace again or go further down the algorithm. Because what you'll often find is if you correct the fibrinogen, even though your XTEM might indicate on your original uh, test that you need some platelets once you've corrected the fibrinogen that allow the, 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 the clot stability improves independent on needing new platelets. Um, at the top of our algorithm, as you'll see, you often, um, we, we always run a, an IBG or VBG with it just to get the haemoglobin up. It's really important to have your haemoglobin at 70 for actual contact activation of platelets against the endothelium with their flow dynamics, as well as keep your um, ionized calcium and pH and temperature up as able. Um, we've sort of gone through that. 
We'll just end uh, with two case vinaigrettes. I think I've got a little a couple of time. Um, so these, when you're instituting any new system, we moved from a from a from an old from a we got a new built new hospital and on the transition across, we used this as an opportunity to implement some new programs, particularly with our trauma service. When you have a new program, often you need a couple of good wins to get people interested and motivated and appreciate what you're trying to do. So we had a 40-year-old male who was surfing in the northern New South Wales who got bitten by a shark. Unfortunately, it's not that uncommon in Australia anymore. Um, he was extracted from the sea. It's a lovely part of the world. Uh, we go there often. I don't swim there as much as I used to. Uh, but Byron Bay is part of his, it, it, there's a, the lighthouse is, I think, one of the most easterly points in Australia. He was shocked, he got a tourniquet, he got some really good pre-hospital treatment and started on tranexamic acid and chopped it into us. Um, from Byron Bay to our university hospital, um, generally about an hour and 15 minutes. There are lots of road works up through Rabina, which is the orange there, so that could be anything to an hour and a half. Obviously with lights and sirens, that'll be different. But by chopper, it's 20 minutes by air. We're fortunate enough to have a helipad. So that's what his leg looked like uh, with the tourniquet on um, and a reasonable bite out of, the, out of the surfboard. When he got to us, he was, he was acidemic, hyperlactatemic, um, and uh, based on a whole lot of things, but just looking at his leg, he was a red blanket to theatres, and we initiated the MHP. If you look at his rotem initially, um, his A5 was 8, which would uh, um, indicate potentially that we, well, we would, it would be a trigger for us to give him some fibrinogen concentrate. Um, and if you looked on the S, then that's really low. We had one of value around 35. Um, generally, in this type of situation, uh, we would give platelets as well, which we did. Um, you can see, as time went by, initially he corrected. And this is one of the really important things as to why you need to reassess all the time. Because as uh, they were working on him in theater, and as the anaesthetists were resuscitating him and giving him fluid, all appropriate, you can see that he drops down again, most of started to bleed again, and uh, we recorrected everything. Um, so over the course of about quarter to eight to about half past ten, he got eight grams of fibrinogen concentrate and some platelets. He had a total of ten units of packed red blood cells and a significant defect in theatre. The last case I'll do quickly, I think I've got a minute or two, is a young 21-year-old entrepreneur who started a um, landscaping business. He rolled his bobcat um, and got pinned underneath the bobcat. Um, fortunately, missed his head, but he was trapped and had obvious uh, chest and abdominal injuries. Uh, emergency paramedics, the bilateral finger thoracostomies on him, and he put up, was given a pelvic blinder and transported to us. So he was working up on the top of the ridge up here and he rolled down there. That's about, oh, I didn't go there, but it was a really significant fall. And in fact, um, the neighbor was uh, one of our ED physicians who was clearly getting his hands dirty during the, during the initial resuscitation phase. He came in again uh, was red blanketed to, to, uh, to theatre for damage control laparotomy. He had bilateral ice, uh, intercostal drains put in, washout and fixation of his fractures. Um, and initially responded really well to um, factor replacement as per our algorithm. He was then sent to, uh, to, from, uh, from theatre to CT and into ICU. And as they're wheeling him up into the unit, they said he's got a tension pneumothorax, we've got a chest drain into him. He then further deteriorated, he got a toe, and he had a tamponade, which they then took him back to theatre, did a thoracotomy on, and put a pleural drain. And when they were in theatre, um, the surgeon said these lungs are completely hepatised and, and just solid, and then Ethan just said, well, I can't recruit him. 
Um, and uh, that was his guess. So he's profoundly hypoxemic. Um, but if you look, actually, he's not that physiologically deranged. So he's really nicely resuscitated. Um, but we we're left with the decision now with this young 21-year-old uh, with devastating lung injury uh, and a really, in, uh, quite frankly, an inability to ventilate. So we put him on VV ECMO. And one of the reasons why we were comfortable putting him on VV ECMO is because he was so well um, controlled from his hemostatic profile with the ongoing resuscitation of the rotin. It was further complicated by the fact that he had a conservatively managed splenic injury that uh, the surgeons had decided not to take out. And we had discussed that if that bled, we would just take him down to interventional radiology for an embolization. We 56 seconds. Um, so that's what he looked at. <laughs> that was us putting him on. We're, look, as, a, as with everything, it's a massive team effort. Um, that was his chest x-ray. Um, he, was, he was as sick as you can be in our unit. Um, uh, and you can see he was randomized to get the TXA and on our FASTI study. Um, he had an uneventful ECMO run, and just before we were about to um, decannulate him, all our patients pre-ECMO decannulation get a rotin, um, and we saw that picture. So it was a little bit concerning because we were about to take out some big catheters, cannulas out, out of his groins, um, and we weren't exactly sure what was going on. Um, we weren't sure whether it was a DRC with his clot in the filter, um, unsure as to the etiology it was what was happening but we um, we decided we had to obviously decannulate him we gave him uh, two units of factor concentrate and some TXA the rotum corrected day one post removal of the circuit he looked great and um, that's him ten days later and the only other therapeutic intervention we did is we finally convinced him to cut his man bun thank you